I'm uh, Jeff from the S2K channel, well, guest hosting, and we have our guest today is Stuart Chaffet. And, yeah, I'm, I'm not really good at this, so you guys got to give me a minute here. Uh, we have Charlie and uh, hey. Ben with us. So we're going to ask him some questions, and uh, Charlie, would you like to go first, since you probably have the better questions? I do, do I? Oh, well, thank you. You probably um, do. Well, it's it's a pleasure finally getting to talk to you, Mr. Uh, Shepherd. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, yes. Yeah, well, where do we begin? I mean, um, your show has been a huge influence over the history, even over here on the Internet, um, on the last few years uh, being through YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, are you still involved with the with the production of TV shows and stuff like that? Uh, yes, doing TV shows, not really doing too much on computers and technology right now. I, you know, I did that show for 20 years, and I got, I think that was enough. So <laughs> I've taken a bit of a break from that. And, you know, when I, I stopped in uh, 2003, I guess it was, things had gotten a little boring, actually. And it was also the period of the, the dot-com bust when you know, it was getting a little bit tougher to get money to do these kinds of things. So I moved over to doing different kinds of stuff. So I, I still do... Television, but uh, not not that much technology now. See, so the beauty of your show, I've, I've found the beauty of your show is it's because you're always talking about what the most current thing is in computing. You've always exactly. got fresh material to work with, you know. Oh, yeah, that was, that was always fun seeing stuff before everybody else saw it. Was that your um, point? Oh, go ahead. That's, that's to start off with. I mean, yeah, this yeah. is more. Um, are, you, are you still involved with computers at all? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, you know, once you're a junkie, you're a junkie. So, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I play with computers all the time, sure. And, you know, nowadays, I mean, not, you know, any sort of digital personal devices. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a gadget junkie, sure. <laughs> what other hobbies are you into? Like, uh, am you a big fan of music or...? A uh, me medium fan of music, not a not a crazy fan of music, but uh, yeah, spend time with music. But yeah, I like I like I like gadgets and technology and toys, electronic toys. If it, if it takes a battery, I'm happy. I was just wanting to know how did you guys start Computer Chronicles? Like I've tried to look it up on Wikipedia, I can't figure it out. I mean, how did it start? Well, it's a really really interesting question. It was really a, a grassroots movement. What started. Uh, you guys may not be old enough to remember, but back in the early 1980s when personal computers first came out and you had, the, you know, the first Apple II and the Tandy TRS-80 and all that stuff, there was no support system. There were no magazines. There were no TV shows. There was nothing. Right. What there was was users group meetings. And that's how, every you know, guys would get together once a week and say, oh, I figured out how to do this and I found this thing and I got this hack and so on and so forth. And I got the I was living here in the in the Bay Area in the San Francisco area at the time, and I got the idea to and I was running a television station at the time, of actually televising live a weekly users group meeting, so that instead of thirty guys in a room sharing this stuff, you could have thousands of people sharing this information. So it started as a little local TV show in which a bunch of hackers would get together and come to the studio and talk about all the new things they'd figured out over the past week. And even back in the early 80s, it was pre-internet, but you still had bulletin board systems going. And the guys on the BBS started talking to each other. And I started getting, uh, actually the TV stations started getting phone calls from other TV stations around the country. We were getting phone calls from gadget geeks in their community saying, we hear there's this damn show on the air. We want to watch it. We want to go to this meeting, too. <laughs> and uh, we figured, well, guys, this is a good idea. So we went out looking for some money and found some uh, some sponsorship money and turned it from a local show into a national show. And literally, by just answering the phone, we never tried to sell it. It you know, was on in like 35 cities to begin with, and it ended up in over 200 cities in the United States and over 100 wow. countries around the world. Awesome. Yeah, it really was. Let's see, it, was really, it was really driven by people just saying, this is cool, I can't get this anywhere else. Well, yeah, I, I w I'm 20, so by the time I watched your show, it was 98, I think, I really started watching. I've always I've been in the computer since I was about five. I've yeah, been, I've yeah. been Commodore 64. Oh, yeah. I, 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 still ha I still have a couple of Commodore Amiga computers. I have one. I have an Amiga 4000. Yeah. Hang around. 
But yeah. yeah I, I have so much old stuff. I, I can open up my own museum. I don't know what to do with it all. I got really old video game consoles and old PCs and old computers. So do we. We're all collectors here. Separate. Yeah, I know. Every, every time I would upgrade a computer, I'd always pull the old one apart. And, yeah. Yeah, of course. In fact, I have I have here something. My, one of my favorites is the original laptop computer, uh, which was which was the uh, HP Portable from the 1980s, sometime. And I, I was the first guy that ever used a laptop on an airplane. People would walk by and say, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> and it was a it was a great little machine. It had uh, it it had no hard drive. It had all the software in ROM, and so it was fast as could be. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was working on airplanes before anybody ever thought about this, and I still have it, and it works. Wow. wow. The HP port, it and at the time, like it's, and it sold, I think, you know, it was you know, a tiny processor, tiny memory. I think at the time it sold for like $5,000. I was just amazed. I looked back in the 80s and how expensive these computers were and how people were just able to afford them. I mean, sometimes... It was expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, dang, but, I mean, compared to today, I can get a laptop for, you know, good oh, $800. Course. But keep in mind, at the time, I mean, it was such a revolutionary tool, and you know, especially when considering the software. I mean, when you had things like spreadsheets, these computers were worth their weight in gold because you could do things so much more efficiently. Yeah. I mean, it was a large degree. It was really spreadsheets, uh, you know, in the old uh, uh, VisiCalc that really pushed computers because it was a fantastic software application that nobody had ever been able to even imagine before. I still have the original VisiCalc software from the Apple II. Wow. Wow. The, the very first spreadsheet. It's amazing how far we've come. Oh, it really is. Yeah, I, I think, I know, I, I sort of mess around on the computer now, and, you know, you're watching video and audio and all this stuff, and I think, wow, I mean, I remember, I remember when I first went online with my TRS-80 computer at 300 baud, and you could watch the letters form one letter at a time. Yeah, yeah. And now we're watching. Well, that movies. brings me. That brings me to the next question. You know, with the uh, new iPhone release, do you think it was the uh, the biggest thing we uh, we've had in the way of uh, next step up in technology since the Macintosh came out back in '84? Well, I must admit, I just finally bought my iPhone 3GS. Uh, I've, I've never, it's a long story, but I've, I've had my quarrels with Apple and Steve Jobs over the years. So I very reluctantly move into Apple products. But I must say the iPhone is one of the slickest gadgets I've ever seen in my life. It's quite fantastic. Do you, you think it's summed up um, where we've moved in the direction of computing in the last five years or so, since like 2004? Well, it does in the sense, I mean, as, yeah, you make a good point. I mean, it's not really a phone. It's a, it's a portable wireless computer, and you happen to be able to make phone calls on it. Uh, yeah. But I find in the way I use it, uh, I mean, the phone is just almost sort of one minor aspect of it. It, it is, I mean, the, the software execution on that iPhone is just brilliant. It really is. I mean, I've, I've you know, I've been, you know, obviously a cell phone user forever and, uh, you know, constantly looking for the latest, best gadget. And I looked at every single phone out there, and the uh, you know the the way the the iPhone works is just is really superior. I think it is it is cutting edge. I mean, if they, the only thing I really maybe it's out there. I don't know yet. I mean, I would like to see a physical keyboard peripheral on it to solve the problems of the on-screen keyboard. If you really want to do you know a lot of data entry, but uh, other than that, the way the thing works and the App Store and all that, I mean, it's just. Incredible. Matter of fact, I was I was traveling a couple of days ago, and I'm a big baseball fan, and I was just dying to watch this one baseball game, and it wasn't on TV, and I couldn't get it anywhere, and I just bought the MLB app on the iPhone, and I was watching the damn baseball game on the iPhone. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, you, can, yeah. you can do anything. It's amazing. Mm. Yeah. And the way it handles email is fantastic. I mean, it's I, I've had before the iPhone, I had a Palm Trio. Yeah, uh, which you know, which was pretty state of the art when it first came out. But I mean, iPhone kind of leaves it in the dust, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I had a, I, or a, a Palm Trail 750 a couple years yep. ago, and that just really blew me away. Uh, yeah. Just seeing the iPhone just a couple of days ago, uh, the the newest one, and that just yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just yeah, it just it just works. I mean, it really really is well done, and it's pretty fast. You know, the built-in Wi-Fi is really great. Uh, as I say, the web applications are, are 
you know, almost more important than the uh, than the phone part of it. You know, it's a shame it's, you know, you're stuck with AT&T. I mean, that's one of the negatives on that. Yeah, I live in an area where we don't have AT&T coverage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have my... It's, uh, I have, open, open. it's open here in Australia, which is good, too. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. But I'm a big fan of the... I'm a big fan of the show Cranky Geeks, and uh, there's one thing yeah. that um, keeps on being repeated over and over again. It's usually the apps is what sell a device. Of course. And uh, I think in the iPhone section, I think it really has completely blown our mind. You know, not just not just in a small way either. You know. Oh, I mean, it's always been the case. You're absolutely right. I mean, we I just talked about Visicalc. Really, is why people the software is why people bought PCs in the early days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's a weird – computers is a – there's no business really quite like that where the hardware is just a platform. It, it's totally useless without the software. And if you establish a popular platform, uh, I think there's no other business where – I mean, the reason Microsoft became so powerful because people just want one standard. Yeah. They, yeah. they don't want five different things to worry about. The reason – eBay become popular. The reason Amazon became popular. Because in this digital world, it's easier to have one place to go. Just and so when, when one platform hey, Atlas, yeah. gets software support or, or application support, it's going to dominate because mm -hmm. of the software, not because of the hardware. Definitely. Just like uh, Google in the past couple of years, uh, just as far as online, just being a you know one stop for you know, like Google Earth and Oh yeah, well, you know, Google, Google's playing their cards uh, pretty smart because it's the yeah, same it's idea. I mean, once once you become the the sort of the portal, the first place you go when you go online, that's tremendous economic power, obviously. Yes. But Google is Google. I know a lot about Google. Those guys have uh, that company changed radically when it went public. So it's not the same Google as it was back then. That's for sure, is it? Well, any company that has to have a motto, do no evil, you know is doing evil. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't need that motto. Uh, yeah, well, I, mean, they were, I mean, I knew that company before anybody had ever heard of Google, and, and I knew Sergey and Larry. I mean, they were, you know, they were smart kids that put together something really cool. But then when a billion dollars ended up in their lap, and the economic consequences of every decision had big dollar signs in front of it, you know, they, they started acting more like Microsoft than like a startup. Oh, yeah, that. And, and I mean, they, they, you can they, see they're definitely bringing up the rear in the sense of um, what they're developing now, besides just the online cloud applications. You've also got, uh, you know, whispers of a new operating system coming out by Google. Oh, absolutely. You've got them joining, you've got them joining that, um, that union group um, against uh, suing yeah. Linux you know, users and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. They, uh, I mean, they have so much money, you know. I mean, they're, they're the, you know, the Microsoft of this decade. They can do anything they want, really. And they have huge power, as Microsoft had with Windows and with Office, to take advantage of the position uh, with their customers by way of the search engine to do a million other businesses. Should um, Microsoft be worried about Linux at the moment? Uh, Have you started to get to that point yet? Well, I think Microsoft has been worried about Linux, I mean, for a long time. I mean, Linux has taken a big chunk out of Microsoft business in certain areas. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I think there's a limit to how far Linux can go in attacking Microsoft, certainly on the, on the operating system side. I mean, it's a bit, Linux has been around for a while. Uh, it hasn't really hurt uh, Windows that much. I, mean, I think they're more concerned with Google directly in a way than they are with Linux. That's why they made that 10-year deal with Yahoo. Yes, exactly, exactly. But, yeah, i gotta, I got to agree with you on that. I mean, I tried Linux for a little while, and I, it doesn't compare to Windows. It's just something about Windows that I like. Yeah, I mean, Linux is nice. I mean, the first netbook I bought, I bought with Linux on it. I figured, oh, you know, why not? And uh, it was just too much of a pain, really. And I kind of agree with you on that whole Apple thing, but my problem with Apple is I just have this, they have this thing where they think they're better, they're more trendy than everyone, and I just, I don't like that. Well, Apple is a religion, it's not really a company, you know. I mean, I bought a Zune, everyone I know owns an iPod, I'm like the only right. person with this thing. <laughs> proud of you, very proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> I like it, yeah, I mean, for 14 yeah, I mean, 
But they're extremely clever at marketing. They're extremely clever at advertising. They've built up this image where people are willing to pay 50% more to get an Apple product, which in most cases yeah. is the same. Yeah. And I defy anybody to tell me that a Macintosh really is easier to use than a PC. It's simply not. Yeah. Oh, my friend James would get in an argument with you. He just got a MacBook like six months ago, and he thinks it's like the greatest thing ever. That's because he's part of that religion, you see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're, look, they're good machines, but I mean, I, you know, I, I crash just as much on my Mac as I do on my PC. Sometimes I have just as many problems installing things on a Mac as I do on a PC. And the Mac does some things, you know, does media very well, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, a PC, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I go back to the DOS days, you know, when, when you didn't have uh, a graphical user interface. And even still on Windows, you have the feeling you can get inside more and look at yeah. things more and have more control. Yeah. The Mac is more closed to you, it seems to me. Well, yeah, I mean, I just prefer my, I mean, I got a, just a Toshiba laptop, and I like it because I'm a, I'm a gamer, so I oh, yeah. play yeah. games on Macs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another good example of what we were talking about before, about how software drives hardware success. I mean, when you know, the Mac only having 10, less than 10% of the market in hardware, uh, you know, there wasn't the software to support it. And so people, right, if you're a gamer, if you're, if you're into business applications, you're going to go into Windows because there's just more choice. Exactly. That actually brings up a good question I've got here, actually. Um, NVIDIA released a GPU that is able to perform like multimedia tasks like sound, HD video, graphics rendering and possibly act as a central CPU for like netbooks and stuff like that. Yeah. Are there any high-end desktop models being built that are Microsoft looking at competing, um, sorry, compiling a Windows to run on the platform? I, I don't know of that. That's a really interesting question. I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, you know, M Microsoft has become a bit, a bit stodgy over the past couple of years, obviously, and lost a little bit of their their uh, flexibility and ability to move quickly. Uh, but it's really, really funny, actually, speaking about Microsoft. Some years ago, I was interviewing Bill Gates, and this is the time when Microsoft owned the world. I mean, Windows was everything. And I remember him sitting there saying, you know, I go to bed every night worrying about what haven't I thought about that's going to do me in tomorrow. <laughs> and everybody thought, what a ridiculous thing for Bill Gates to be worrying about somebody doing him in. And what he wasn't thinking about was, was Google and the web and all that stuff. I think Microsoft just spread themselves out too much with these new media devices, the new game consoles. Yeah, yeah. And too much. I mean, they're successful usually in most markets, but right, it's, right. It's to get to them. Well, they just somehow got the sort of, you know, evil Darth Vader image after a while because of some of the, you know, I mean, they are very aggressive in the way they deal with competition, the way they blew out Netscape and so on. I uh, just so, like Netscape. Yeah, but I mean, you know, Microsoft, as Google does now, uses its power yeah. to try to dominate any field it gets into it. And when, when you had Windows platform, you could control what browser people were going to use, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because Google now has the ability to control a lot of things if people are going to be in the cloud. It was the same with real media as well back in the day. As Absolutely. Well, yeah, same deal, right. I mean, the, the, the sad thing is, we were talking about you know, my stopping the show in 2003. I mean, there was a period of time when there really was something called a software industry. And basically, half of the things you used to, except for games, half the things you used to buy as packaged software they're not there anymore because they're all been absorbed into an operating system. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. It, I mean, it used to be a lot of fun shopping for software. Now there's there's, there's nothing there anymore. Everything is sort of taken care of and all sort of integrated. Remember, remember yeah. one of your videos you did um, on the Chronicles, uh, talking about the OS2 warp. And oh yes. The guy was on showing a uh, a media center. Right. And yeah, it's quite funny because it is your basic media player now. You know. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There's actually a very funny episode, I don't know if you happen to see it, in which we had on a guy from a guy from Microsoft during the IBM OS2 period. And, and I don't know if you remember, there's a long story there about it. For a while, IBM and Microsoft had a deal. And the guy from Microsoft who was showing off some, you know, Windows 3.1 or something like that, was said, well, of course, OS2 is the operating system of the future. <laughs> and he was slightly wrong. Why is it um, OS2 looks so much like Windows 95? Uh, that's a good question, because why shouldn't it? I mean, 
after a while, there is a sort of standard that people like and expect. Look, why does why did Windows 95 look like the Macintosh interface in a way? You know, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Once people got the idea of a GUI of a graphical user interface, I mean, the principles were sort of the same. I mean, it's an interesting question. I remember some years ago uh, when there was a, there were a lot of competitive spreadsheets on the market, and there were five or yeah. six different spreadsheets you could buy. And there was a big intellectual property patent copyright issue going out there about, you know, can you own the layout of a spreadsheet and the layout of the menus on top and so on. And one of the guys, uh, a guy named Philippe Kahn, who ran a company called Borland that had a very good spreadsheet program out there, uh, was actually sued by, I think it was Lotus at the time, for stealing the spreadsheet interface. And he made a very good point. He said, he said, there are certain things you can't own. He said, can you imagine that if you come out with a car, you're going to tell me that Ford owns where the clutch goes and where the brake goes and where the steering wheel goes? Yeah, and where the you wheels go. That. And, you know, there are certain yeah. standards that simply have to be accepted and people have the right to use those. Well, I think uh, everyone just took the idea from the GUI. I mean, like they're designed from Linux. Because wasn't Linux the first one to come out with a GUI? No, no, no. I there was so. the um, oh, was Xerox. Xerox yeah, was the first uh, one. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, right. It was, oh, it was Xerox. Xerox Park. Linux. Really. I don't know what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. I meant Xerox, but yeah. Oh, yeah, they were the and first then, ones. Of course, and, of course, I mean, frankly, Apple and Steve Jobs stole it from Xerox. Yeah, they did. They just, well, at least, I mean, they just took it. Absolutely. But yeah. Absolutely. They, it was the guys at Xerox Park that developed the GUI and the mouse interface and all that. Sure. Didn't they uh, pay, like, 10000 Uh Penis, like, yeah. Right, uh, yeah. Okay, there's one more question I've been personally wanted to ask you, Stuart. Sure. Um, okay, as you're aware, um, okay, uh, talking about something quite complicated and making it understandable for and like a non-average computer person, or you know, like the average non-computer person, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, lately, there has been like a boom in like game reviewers on the internet and stuff like that, who yeah. are like starting to find their voice and sharing lots of advice and stuff like that in that department. Right. right. Um, what advice have you got for like people you know who are doing these shows, you know, trying to relate this complicated? you know, kind of technical jargon to a uh, wider audience who isn't, you know, so much game-related. Well, that's maybe game-related but not technical-related, but, you know, it's trying to translate it down. Well, that's that's the real challenge, and I think, as I think uh, you suggested earlier, that was, I think, one of the things I'm proud of of what we do with Computer Chronicles. I mean, that's the whole point is how do you explain complicated things to people who don't have the ability or the time or the patience to deal with complicated stuff. And in the early days, you know, you really had to know how to, you know, take the computer apart and figure out an awful lot of things. And you had to install, you know, drivers and flip dip switches and on and on and on and on. Yeah, and, and even uh, breaking that down to um, semi-complicated talk is still hard, you know? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a real challenge. I mean, the, the good news in a way is, you know, technology really has gotten so much simpler than it was. I remember... There was a time, you know, uh, we were talking to, I think it was Macworld Magazine at the time, about becoming one of the sponsors of our show, and I had a very interesting conversation with the guy who was the editor of Macworld, and he said, you know, we're really worried about our business, and at that time, I mean, computer magazines were really big, and he said, he said, you know, I used to be in the photography magazine business, and there used to be 30 magazines about photography, and now there's about two, because cameras, you don't have to know anything about a camera anymore, you press the button. In the old days, you had to know about aperture and this and AS, uh, film speeds and so on and so forth. And he said, when things get simple, nobody needs magazines anymore. Nobody needs these things anymore. And to some degree, that's happened with computers where, uh, or most technology, which is it, it is relatively simple. Yeah. Even if you're a gamer, you don't have you don't have to know a lot, you know, to take advantage of most of the stuff. But the, 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 it's really really difficult to. I always thought of myself as a as like a UN translator. You know, translating geek talk into yeah, normal yeah. talk so that people could understand what the hell you were talking about when you <laughs> had to deal with complicated subjects. And but did you understand what they were, what the uh, what the technical people were talking about all the time? Or yeah, well, I mean, um, it was another interesting example of that is yeah, there were you know we would have guests on the show. It was classic. If we'd have on some mid-level guy who was a programmer or a developer of some sort. He could come in and whiz through demonstrations and explain everything. 
The real problem was when the CEO would come on as a guest, and he didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> and he had to bring some guy who behind his head, press over here and press that. And, <laughs> and so even even within the industry, you know, the knowledge was really at a mid-level somewhere with the guys who actually did stuff. But often the people running these businesses really didn't understand the technology either. They understood the business and the sales side of it. Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's always been that way. That's like uh, Bill Gates getting a blue screen. You got it. You got it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you another funny Bill Gates story. We're talking about Microsoft and Apple. Yeah. There was, I, I think it was maybe the introduction of Windows 98, I believe it was at a Comdex. And uh, Bill Gates was on stage doing this big introduction. And, of course, he had all these effects and the rolling videos and music and all that. And all this stuff in a little dark room behind the stage was coming off Macintoshes. <laughs> Really? Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh. Wow. Right. Wouldn't that be an interesting photo to have, you know? Yeah. Oh, my, oh my God. Well, I happen, I happen to know a guy who was working on that presentation who was back there in that little dark room. And he came to me afterward and he said, could you believe we're doing this on a Mac? <laughs> <laughs> so the introduction of Windows 98 was presented on a Mac. Because you know it was a better platform for doing multimedia at the time. Yeah, they were they were they they managed to uh, utilize the CPU a lot better back then, didn't they? Oh yeah. Well, of course. I mean, the the, the, the first brilliant media machine was the Amiga. Yeah, that all the video. I, mean, I remember game, games on the Amiga were were light years ahead of anything else on the Apple yeah. or the PC. I mean, the Amiga graphics and sound were extraordinary in the early days. I loved using a video toaster. I love doing Oh, yeah. You know Toaster, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's a great... Oh, yeah. I know those guys very well. Yeah, I remember I was watching an episode when you were interviewing uh, some people. I think it was for the Amiga 3000. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the Toaster was it was a brilliant... I mean, that was the first time you could actually use your computer to do video and television. Yeah. It was with the Toaster. But look, think of that, too. I mean, the to when that Toaster board came out, that was about 5000 bucks for the card. Yeah. As you say, in your four hundred dollar laptop, you can do you can do video editing all you want. Yeah. Well, it was like two hundred dollars just for a mega RAM back then, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I remember paying, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a ten megabyte memory card for a PC. Hey, you can go out, and pay twenty dollars, get a gig or two of RAM. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's all good news, isn't it? That these things do get better and cheaper. Yeah, that's good. They sure do. They sure do. I mean, thank goodness. I mean, that we can buy, you know, as you say, you know, a pretty damn good Toshiba laptop for under five hundred dollars now. Well, actually, I mean, it's eight hundred, but yeah. Whatever, but I mean, it's um, really unbelievable. Yeah. Stuart, have you ever been to the computer museum? Oh, of course. How, I, how, how do you? What do you think of it? Like in comparison to your experience over the years of computers? You talking about the one here in the Bay Area? Um. Because the original computer museum was in Boston. Okay, yes, that's the one I was And the original, was original, the original, original computer museum was a digital equipment corporation outside Boston. That, that's a history. Oh. I mean, the guy who ran DEC, <coughs> DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, was like yep. the rest of it. He collected all this junk. And he had a garage full of stuff. And he actually went to somebody in Boston and said, we should turn this into a museum. And he actually, the museum started in his house. And then at some wow. point they took all this junk and they moved it over to in, into this computer museum in downtown Boston. But they went out of business and then they moved all that stuff out here to California. And during the dot-com bust in about 2002, when lots of companies went out of business and there was all kinds of empty offices, they were able to buy this huge building for like a million bucks, whereas before it was worth $10 million, And that became the home of the computer museum here. That's different, by the way. There's also something called the Tech Museum here in San Jose which is different from the Computer Museum. The Computer Museum has great stuff. And, and the, the Tech Museum, computer, I imagine, would be is also like home home application devices and stuff, yeah? Uh, it's more sort of a science, general science-y kind of museum, but the Computer Museum has all the old toys. And yeah. in fact, is if you go to the Computer Museum, they actually have, <clears throat> they have old pieces of video from my shows explaining some of the stuff. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> There's also a very interesting that's exhibit in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Most people don't know it, but Microsoft actually started in Albuquerque. Yeah, I remember. And that. there's a there's a museum there that actually has some really great stuff of the early early days of 
Oh, was that the Altairs or? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Was there a computer crash in 83, or was that just the video game crash? Because I know Mark, no, that was just the video game crash. I don't know. That was video game crash, I yeah. Because yeah. that, that's when the computer market boomed right there. Right, yeah, no, the early 80s when everything started happening, sure. I mean, I got my first computer, oh, I don't know, early, yeah, early, probably late in 70s maybe. I think I got my first TRS-80 and yeah. my, what was it, what was the very other one? There was uh, the early Commodore, Commodore 64. Uh, probably 1979. Yeah. Oh. Oh, wow. My first computer was in 1985, the Amstrad 1512 SD. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. You guys had those European games, yeah. Oh, you had millions of choices in those early days, and everybody was, you know, trying to figure out what was going to work. And they're always trying to put a brand name on them where they found out it ended up being the best way to go was to be uh, IBM compatible, no name. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's an interesting story, too, about, you know, you know, sort of business people classically talk about Apple and Steve Jobs and what a mistake they made by thinking of themselves as a hardware company instead of a, a software platform, an operating system company. And had they not gotten trapped in thinking we build boxes, they could have become Microsoft. They could have become Windows. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they'd been willing to go out and license the Mac OS, you would have had all the Mac clones out there, but they never wanted to do that. For a short period of time after Jobs left, they did. Yeah. And when Jobs came back, they stopped doing that. Because you did have Mac clones for a couple of years back in the late, maybe early 90s, I think. Yeah, during yeah, I don't know, the mid '90s, Apple just success was terrible. The thing that amazes me with the Mac is just how similar to the iPhone um, it is when it comes to its release. You know, there yeah. was a huge, there's a huge outburst of, uh, of a buy right at the very beginning. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. all these weird and strange applications coming out for it that yeah. people haven't really figured out what direction they're going to go with and stuff yeah. like that. You know. And it just, it's just absurd how how similar, you know, they're, they're following the pattern again, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't know if you uh, know about this, but Apple's been buying up, I mean, like, uh, hiring uh, these key game designers. They're, there's rumors they're planning out to come with a new game console. And I try and tell people, do you ever remember the Apple Pippin? Yeah, right. Like, if they know, and it's like, well, yeah, look that up. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. No, I mean, the interesting rumors about uh, Apple now are... Uh, either a, a ebook reader or a really high end netbook or tablet version of a netbook. I mean, it's hard to imagine gonna Apple's going to. Yeah. No, hard to imagine Apple's not going to get into this whole netbook and and. Uh... Yeah, they've already got the MacBook Air. You know, the three thousand yeah. dollar paperweight. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Hey guys, I got like about that. another five minutes on the iPhone gonna... and the netbook. Okay, I, I heard you. All right. So, anyone got any last questions? Since we're starting to run out of time. No, um, I'm, I'm, I had kind of an Apple question. Um, sure. I've I've noticed here lately, like definitely with the iPhone. Um, you know, they're they're up to like the third version of that. You know, you had that. Yep. iPhone 3G. Now you got 3GS. 3GS, um, yeah. It, it seems pretty aggressive. Uh, were they like that back, uh, like in the early 80s? With, with the, uh. Yeah, I think, I think I mean, you know, the, the computer industry is a funny game because you've got to always find an excuse for people to buy a new version of something. <clears throat> you know, it's sort of like cars in a way. So uh, it's all a marketing game. I mean, you, you've got to hold stuff back, and then six months, a year come along and say, oh, this now does something the old one didn't do, and you've right. got to go throw out the three thing you just spent a couple hundred bucks on and buy another one. Yeah. So, I mean, that's all, all part of the strategy. I mean, uh, you know, the, there, are, there are certain businesses like, you know, kitchen appliances or cars these days which are suffering because the damn things last too long and then no new version really comes. I mean, if you buy a new car it's not really radically different from the car you had 10 years ago yeah. uh, you don't have to buy a new car but in the technology field you kind of have to buy a new phone you kind of have to buy a new computer because it's going to do something the old one didn't do plus you're going to throw all that marketing pizzazz and advertising behind it so it's uh, it's not necessarily you know, a lot of that stuff isn't technology driven it's really marketing driven I think and even, I mean, there's some really ridiculous things going on. If you look at, for instance, Microsoft Works, you know, which is bundled free on most PCs, you know, they actually go out of their way to remove features from Office just because they want to force you to buy Office. I mean, they spend money making Works worse. 
So it's like a teaser. It's just a marketing game. And I always use works. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a handy little free Probably program. It's oxymoron, you know? Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Does anyone have anything else before we close, then? Uh, I think we've, we've covered just about everything, haven't we? I think we know? did a pretty good yeah. interview. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, well, nice, nice talking to you guys. It's nice to uh, yeah, talk, nice. talk think about these things. Really nice to talk with you. Yeah, this is nice. Yes, I it's agree. It's been a pleasure, Stuart. Thank you for having okay, me. Okay, pleasure meeting you guys. Yep. Thank you, Stuart. Stuart Chaffet, everybody. Bye-bye.